gather your party before venturing forth. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Dungeon Pub. I am once again your very humble bartender. We're still doing Happy Hour, which means if you're new, if you don't know what RPGs are, if you've never played 5th edition, welcome to the show. Last time, we spoke about the Ranger, part one, right there in the annotation. I might have harped a little bit. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna say it right now. I might have harped a little bit about the Ranger, the way it was when it first came out in 5th edition. But, as I said in that video, we are going to cover for the first time ever in this project, the Unearthed Arcana. Because if you haven't gotten the news, the Ranger was redone. It was redone some time ago, sometime after release, and it's better. Oh dear lord, is it so much better. We discussed all of the abilities of the Ranger in the previous part, and now we got to the archetypes. So by the basic book, by the player's handbook that came out, the very first book that ever came out of 5th edition, the Ranger has two archetypes, Hunter and Beastmaster. And when you read those two, you immediately again start to uncover more, or rather reinforce your understanding about what, an, uh, what a Ranger is supposed to be. No more delays, let's get right into the thick of things. If you're interested about learning more about Rangers and what they're supposed to be like, go watch the previous video. In this one, we're delving right into the meat and potatoes of the class. Choice number one, <laughs> at level three, Hunter's Prey. You gain one of the following features of your choice. Immediately a difference between everything that we've seen so far. None of the classes, apart from the fighter, Battlemaster more specifically, allows you to pick from a number of abilities when you when you level up in this way. That is because the Ranger, as we said before, is a very specific concept with multiple options in terms of how you engage your enemy, what kind of enemy you engage, or how you wish to conduct your fighting. So Hunter Spray at level 3 immediately is going to show you what the Ranger is intended to be like. You get three choices, Colossus Slayer, Giant Killer, and Horde Breaker. And even the names themselves are geared towards <laughs> allowing you to understand that Rangers are very, very specific about the way they inflict pain and damage. Number one, Colossus Slayer. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, the creature takes an extra 1d8 damage if it's below its hit point maximum. You can deal this extra damage only once per turn. Wonderful, powerful, I like it, amazing. A few things to mind, number one, it has to be hit first. It needs to not be at maximum HP. How it loses that HP, nobody cares. Maybe it trips before combat, maybe you're to blame, maybe the wizard happens, maybe the rogue. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't have maximum HP, you deal more damage with one attack during your turn while targeting that creature. And naturally, if you hit. Amazing. We're gonna talk about ability stacking a bit later, but consider this as we're going over these abilities. Rangers are intended to stack multiple avenues of effects. What does that mean? Well, you have access to spells, but you also have access to these abilities, you have access to your gear choices and, and the way you choose to, to fight your combat. Remember, rangers go off of dexterity, that's gonna be a point we make later on. And you have the two options, melee or ranged, so you can actually set up and stack so many, so many effects on a single creature that you deal a horrendous amount of damage. That has always been a point of the ranger, in 5th edition it's no different, and these abilities especially Colossus Slayer, are <laughs> kind of like a relic from the past that makes me tear up. In any case, moving along, Giant Killer, when a large or larger creature within 5 feet of you hits or misses you with an attack, you can use your reaction to attack that creature immediately after its attack, provided that you can see. Retaliation, amazing. Hit or miss, as long as it's within 5 feet of you, means that it doesn't matter what happens at the end of that creature's attack, you can use your reaction to slap it hit it with a melee weapon, or if you have an interesting combination and <laughs> interesting preferences in life, you can even use arranged weapons, provided that you can see. Again, kind of going back to those abilities that I wasn't particularly <laughs> impressed with, you don't even necessarily have to see if you can if you can combo with that up above. And then lastly, Horde Breaker, once on each of your turns, when you make a weapon attack, you can make another attack with the same weapon against a different creature that is within five feet of the original target and within range of your weapon. So, melee or ranged, doesn't matter. If the two targets are within five feet, you can make another weapon attack. Any ability that allows you to do that is actually amazing. Weapon attacks, especially for classes that are not fighters, are scarce. So you're gonna have to make do with what you have. You're gonna have to make them count. And if you can do multiple, that's cool. But if you can do them for free, that's even better. <laughs> and considering this singular choice very briefly, 
this is how the entirety of the hunter is going to progress. That is very specific for the ranger. Singular target, one larger target, or multiple, multiple targets. No other class in the game, apart from very, very specific builds and choices like the Eldritch Knight, allow you to actually have AoE for a class that essentially depends on weapon attacks and the number of them. Keep that in mind, rangers are still amazing at this. The particular way that they were done in the beginning of 5th edition doesn't take away from their capacity to fight multiple enemies and even avoid them. So, with that being out of the way, at level 7, few more choices. These ones immediately look a little bit more defensive. Escape the Horde, Multi-Attack Defense, and Steel Will. What are they about? Well, Escape the Horde, Opportunity Attacks against you are made with disadvantage. At all times, ever, forever, if you trigger an Opportunity Attack, the creature that is trying to hit you has disadvantage. Amazing. Very powerful, very cool if you're a melee ranger. Even better, in my opinion, if you're ranged, because that means that you can always try to gain more ground and put more distance between you and your, and your intended target. Multi-attack defense. When a creature hits you with an attack, you gain plus four bonus to AC against all subsequent attacks made by that creature for the rest of the turn. This stacks amazingly well with Giant Killer, which, if you don't remember, says that if a creature hits or misses you with an attack, and it's within five feet of you, you can use reaction to attack it back. So this makes you sticky. Coupled with a few feats that we're gonna discuss later on in this in this particular video, this makes you sticky as hell. And if you're a melee ranger, this is amazing. Lastly, Steel Will. You have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. Okay, sure. I mean, frightened is bad, right? It, it takes you out of combat. It, it requires that you make a few saving throws, maybe even wastes the turn where you succeed. Here's the problem with that. It, it's one particular condition and the particularities of this condition mean that you're either fighting something that's already kind of bad, or we're talking beholders and dragons, or or it's not really going to matter all that much because it's something extraordinary. So not necessarily the strongest choice, at least in my opinion, but if, if for whatever reason you're looking at this and you're like, oh yeah, I need this, it's right there for you. Maybe it's a, it's a campaign thing, maybe you're fighting particular kinds of enemies that tend to frighten power to you, and again, defense from, from things that are trying to hurt you. At level 11, multi-attack. This is intended to essentially balance with the fighter's ability at level 11. Most characters that are martial classes, like paladins, barbarians, they get something at level 11 that allows them to be very specific and more powerful at dealing damage. So let's see what these two choices allow you to do. Number one, volley. Number two, whirlwind attack. Volley, you can use your action to make a ranged attack against any number of creatures within 10 feet of a point you can see within your weapon's range. You must have ammunition for each target and you make a separate attack roll for each, each target. Okay. Remember how a few minutes ago I said that anything that allows you to make more than your normal amount of attacks is amazing? Well, this is perhaps the best you're ever gonna see. 10 feet radius is a lot and you can put a lot of enemies in there and you make a separate attack roll for each target, which means you get to add your modifier to every attack. This is geared towards ranged weapons, and most importantly, don't forget, you need to have ammo for every singular attack. If you run out of ammo, kind of sad, kind of puts that wrench in your, in your wheel. The other choice, Whirlwind Attack, literally does the same thing, but geared towards melee. So, coupled with other choices up above, this makes the Hunter a very, very, very interesting archetype. You can build min-max if you're that kind of person, you can add feats to this, you can have very specific choices of spells, you can have very specific choices of engagement and gear. So, Hunters are actually kind of cool. They're one of my favorite archetypes, coupled with the fact that the Ranger is one of my favorite classes. So, again, this is really suave. Last but not least, Superior Hunter's Defense. This makes you even more defendy. At level 15, multiple choices again. And this time three. Evasion. You can nimbly dodge out of the way of certain area effects such as a Red Dragon's Fiery Breath or a Lightning Bolt spell. When you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a Dexterity saving throw, very important, to take only half damage, you instead take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw and only half damage if you fail. Now this might be a bit of a little bit of a repeat, but rogues get the same thing and they get it slightly earlier than this, as a matter of fact, very much earlier than this. But given the fact that you probably are going to have more AC, you're going to be much more sticky in a fight, this is actually very, very potent. I love it. <laughs> it, it gives you this impression that the ranger is this evadey 
very nimble, very fast fighter. Unlike the trudging, plate-wearing fighter guy with the shield and the hammer, or the 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 the, the spewing and 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 shouting barbarian who just hasn't stopped smashing that corpse since 30 seconds ago. In any case, stand against the tide. Second choice, when a hostile creature misses you with a melee attack, you can use your reaction to force that creature to repeat the same attack against another creature, other than itself, of your choice. Misdirection. If multiple creatures are trying to hit you, you can use your reaction once to deliberately move that attack away from you and make that creature make another one against the creature within, within reach. This is kind of cool. <laughs> it can lead into some very funny moments depending on the creatures that are surrounding you. If there's multiple small ones, not that impressive, but if there's like a big, a bigger boss kind of creature and multiple small ones and you're in the middle of them, the bigger guy smashing the smaller ones is going to be hella funny. And of course, lastly, uncanny dodge. When an attacker that you can see hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to have the attack's damage against you. Kind of like a rogue, again, but getting it later on. This is actually kind of cool. And coupled with that particular ability that, again, I wasn't very impressed with, up above from the standard ranger tray, then this means that even if a creature is stealthed, you can still see it, you know it's there, so it's gonna work. And this is pretty much the hunter. The other archetype that we're gonna discuss today is the Beastmaster. And the Beastmaster was underwhelming. I mean, immediately, I didn't, I didn't like it. Not just because it didn't scale well, but because many of these abilities are not necessarily where they need to be in terms of of just feel, if I can if I can put it that way. What do I mean? Well, at third level, you gain a beast companion that accompanies you on your adventures and is trained to fight alongside you. Oh my god, this is so cool! There are people who literally love this kind of concept. I'm talking about the hunters of, of, of World of Warcraft, the people who need pets in their life, and not just in D&D, but people who just love animals, love the companionship, love the idea of not being alone against whatever they're facing. This is so cool and, and and it makes so many people go oh yeah this is what i want to do and before they fix the ranger i went no you don't because it's not that good <laughs> in any case choose a beast that is no larger than medium and that has a challenge rating of a fourth if you don't understand these initially don't worry it takes dms sometimes to get to understand them this is from the monster manual and ask your dm ask your dm how to do this your dm is going to help you because dms are amazing if you don't know and then Add your proficiency bonus to the beast's AC, attack rolls and damage rolls, as well as to any saving throws and skills is proficient in. So far, so good. This is actually kind of cool. It gets to scale with you, alongside you. It gets to benefit from you leveling up. This is so far very cool. It's hit point maximum equals its normal maximum or four times your ranger level, whichever is higher. Okay, this helps some creatures that you can pick. Moving along the ability though, the beast obeys your commands as best as it can. It takes its turn on your initiative. So you roll once and both of you get to act at the same time, though it doesn't take an action unless you command it. Okay, not that bad. On your turn, you can verbally command the beast where to move, no action required by you. You can use your action to verbally command it to take the attack, dash, disengage, dodge or help action. And this is where the concept begins to break because on this area level, you are using your action to do something with the beast. And while that can be very powerful, it's very, very situational. In most occasions, what the beast can do is not going to be better, stronger, or more hurtful to your target than what you can do. So, uh, yeah, this is starting to go downhill already. Once you have the extra attack feature, you can make one weapon attack yourself when you command the beast to take the attack action. Okay, you can make an attack when the beast hits as well. That's at level five. While traveling through your favorite terrain with only the beast, you can move stealthily at a normal pace. If the beast dies, you can obtain another one by spending eight hours. Pets are replaceable. He, I'm, I'm, I can make a joke about parents and goldfish, but you kind of get the point. <laughs> and that's that's about it. This is this is everything. So for for the next few levels, this creature is there. Its positioning can help you. You can have it take the help action, which is an interesting mechanic. But that's about it. You can make one attack with advantage, and that's its strongest strongest point. That versus making two attacks is essentially kind of the same. So this immediately hits me in the stomach. Like, you can have this pet, but it, it mechanically it's not necessarily done very well. Don't worry, in princes, they kind of did it better when they redid the class. We're doing a comparison. We need to get through this. Moving right along, exceptional training. Beginning at seventh level, on any of your turns, when your beast companion doesn't attack, you can use a bonus action to command the beast to take the dash, disengage, dodge, or help. Okay, yeah, now we're, we're cooking with gas, right? Now this is getting better. You can command the beast with a bonus action. The beast 
if it's a powerful melee creature, you just stick it into the face of a target, bonus action, help from the beast, gain advantage, plus all the things that you stacked, meaning Hunter's Mark perhaps, and maybe Colossus Slayer, and suddenly you are actually amazing. But you need to get to level 7, and the other things that the beast can do can also come into play. So this is kind of becoming better, but once again, given that initial ability, it's still kind of trailing behind the hunter in so many ways, and given other archetypes that are out there, this is not necessarily on par. At level 11, Beastial Fury. Your beast companion can make two attacks when you command it to use the attack action. Remember, you still need to use your entire action to do that, so between the beast and yourself, you can make three attacks. This, immediately people say, oh yeah, that's kind of like the fighter at 11th level. Eh, not not necessarily. The, the, the beast can do damage, but it's probably not going to be equal to what you can do at level 11. So do you make that third attack yourself and then have the beast do two or do three yourself? See, math just doesn't work in your favor. So you're still kind of stuck in the seventh level ability where you're using the beast for help actions. Not that bad, but this is essentially unnecessary. Depending on the beast, of course, but Again, Math Crunchers long ago determined that this is not necessarily the best you can do. And lastly, share spells. Beginning at 15th level, you when you cast a spell targeting yourself, you can also affect your beast companion with the spell if the beast is within 30 feet of you. There are things you can do with this, but at this point, uh, why? Okay, no more moping, no more. I promise, I'm done. You kind of got the point. The Unearthed Arcana does it so much better, and, and with the books that got out, and with all the additional options, this actually got very much fixed. So, this is the two archetypes. I, I personally enjoy what they did. I, I love what they did. The Beastmaster is cool. The, the Hunter is even, 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 even better. <laughs> but I'm, I'm a little sad. In any case, this is where we're going to cut today's video. Part 3 is going to be coming very soon. And in that particular part, we're going to talk about, kind of like the Fighter and the Barbarian, feat options, builds, spells as well. Oh yeah, we're going to get into the spells because they are very much essential to the way you're going to play your ranger. Thank you for sticking to the end of this video. If you've stuck to the end of this video, you are amazing. Hit that like button if you like the way we do our business. If you don't like it, if you don't enjoy the way we do things, hit that dislike. Why are you at the end of this video if you don't like it? I don't know, but power to you. Go ahead, comment, follow the links below in the description. You can find us there. Feel free to reach out and I'll see you again in part three.